So we have our external stuff in statics for rigid body equilibrium causing internal stuff in solids to formable body equilibrium. Internal forces distributed over an area is stress. That distribution of forces causes a change, strain, and if we tally up all those strains, we're going to get deformation. The deformation that we're going to talk about today is axial deformation, and we have two axial deformations that we're going to cover in this class. One of them is due to force, and the other is due to temperature. I'll talk about temperature first because that's the shortest explanation. So axial deformation due to temperature is alpha delta T L where alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion. It's a material property that you find in the back of your book. Delta T is the change in temperature that the system is experiencing. And L is the original unloaded, unchanged length of the member. Axial deformation due to force, we're gonna call that delta F, is PL over AE, P being the internal axial force, L being the at rest or unloaded length, A being the cross-sectional area, and E being the modulus of elasticity. The deflection due to force is taking uh, axial stress and axial strain and Hooke's law and putting them all into one nice little tidy package there. So here we have a system that's made out of aluminum. We have a rigid member BCD that is loaded at D with 200 pounds, uh, supported at AC with a rod, and supported at B with a pin. Find the axial deformation of member AC due to that 200 pound load. My axial deformation equation is equal to PL over AE. So working from left to right, top to bottom, the very first thing I need is the axial load in member AC, P. So let's solve that with a free body diagram. I have my pin reactions at B, so I will have BX and BY, and then I will have my two force member reaction AC, force AC, and this is a three, four, five slope. If I sum for my moments about B, zero is equal to minus 200 times 60 inches away. And then we're gonna have that horizontal component, four fifths of force AC, and it is acting 36 inches away counterclockwise. Everything else passes through. The axial force for force AC, 416 and two-thirds pounds and it did come out positive so it is acting in tension. So I can now plug it into my equation. Deflection A to C is equal to P416.6 pounds times the original length which is 60 inches over the cross-sectional area pi over 4 times 0 0.75 inches squared and the modulus of elasticity for aluminum taken from the back of your book which is 10.6 times 10 to the sixth psi my axial deformation in member AC due to the 200 pound force is 5.34 times 10 to the negative 3 inches 
and that is elongation because our force is in tension and that's going to cause it to stretch out. In this example, we have a completely not drawn to scale concrete slab that is six meters in length at rest. There is a 0.9 millimeter gap between the concrete and an immovable wall. Find the temperature change to close the gap. Our axial deformation due to temperature equation is alpha delta T L. So the first thing that I need to get is the coefficient of thermal expansion alpha. And again, we can find that in our book. That last column there is coefficient of thermal expansion. And I have my low strength concrete value of 11 times 10 to the negative six degrees Celsius. The change due to temperature is going to be that 10th of a millimeter gap. We are looking for the temperature change and our original length is six meters. Our temperature change will be in degrees Celsius, but we have millimeters and meters, so make sure your unit conversions are in there. And we're going to find that our required temperature change is 13.7 degrees Celsius, and this will be an increase in temperature to cause the concrete to expand to close the gap. In this example, we have member ABC supported by a link BD and a concrete stump there, AE. Link BD is made of a magnesium alloy, and we want to find the vertical displacement of point C if the system experiences a temperature decrease of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So if the temperature is decreasing, that means that all of our members are going to shrink. I don't really care about member ABC because we're just talking about the vertical displacement of C, but I do care about, um, and not the total displacement of C because it's gonna move up and to the left, right? So I do care about BD and AE. And if I draw a greatly exaggerated picture here, DB is going to shrink, AE is going to shrink. So that means that ABC is going to rotate here. And this is the vertical displacement at C that I am looking for. One way to solve this problem is going to be to take this entire triangle here with that 35 inch width, and we're gonna have what I'm just gonna call H here, height. And we see from what I've got drawn here that if we take the height and subtract that deflection AE due to temperature, we will have the deflection vertically of point C. I still have a lot of unknowns though. So let's see if I can draw some more triangles here. I have a red triangle right here. That's the 15 inch width and I see that my height here is my two temperature deflections. So I can have the temperature deflection for BD plus the temperature deflection for AE all over 15 inches. And I've just got a whole bunch of subscripts on there. Don't mind that. I could do similar triangles and set that equal to that height H that I'm looking for over the entire 35 inch length of my green triangle. So there's my plan of attack. I've got everything in terms of temperature deformation, and I can solve for that vertical deviation at C. This is just one way to solve it, but this is my thought process, so I'm running with it. Deflection due to temperature is equal to alpha delta T L. So our deflection due to temperature for the concrete stump is going to be six times 10 to the negative six 
per degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have a negative 40 degree Fahrenheit temperature change because it is a decrease. And then the original length of my concrete is 10 inches. So that gives me a change in length of negative 0.0024 inches. The change in length of member BD due to temperature is equal to the coefficient of thermal expansion for magnesium alloy, which is 14.3 times 10 to the negative 6 per degrees Fahrenheit times the temperature change, negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and the original length of my member, which is 25 inches. That change in length will be a contraction of 0 0.0143 inches. Now I've already taken contractions into consideration when I drew my triangles and blue, green, and red pictures up here. So all I have to do is plug in magnitudes to the equations that I've created. So my height is going to be 35 fifteenths of 0 0.0143 plus 0 0.0024 and that gives me a value of 0 0.03897 inches and then plugging that into my first equation so I just get that vertical deviation of point C I have 0 0.03897 minus 0 0.0024 and my vertical deviation of point C from its untemperature changed position is 36.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 3 inches and it does move up. So let's say that I've got three soda cans here. All of them are just under five inches tall. So if I stack them up, I get about 14 and a half inches for my total at rest height. I'm going to deflect each can to get new heights of about two and a quarter, three and three quarters, and about four and a quarter inches. My new stacked height is about 10 inches. This time we're given a system with a solid shaft that has a diameter of 15 millimeters. The entire system is A36 steel, and we want to find the horizontal displacement of point A with respect to D. What we're going to find is we have three distinct deflections, A to B, B to C, and C to D. So we're going to find all three of those and then add them together. Looking in the back of my book, I find that the modulus of elasticity for A36 steel is 200 gigapascals. I'm given the lengths, I am given the diameter so I can find the cross-sectional area. So the only thing that I need to find is the load internally throughout my entire system. I'm going to do that with an axial force diagram. Solving for my reactions at fixed end D, I find that the horizontal axial force D is six kilonewtons to the left. That's the only one that I need for my axial force diagram.
starting at A, I have 8 kilonewtons in compression. Nothing comes up here to 4. That jump at 12. I've got two fives, so it's going to come down here to six. And then I come back up to zero with my reaction at D. So with the material being the same and the cross-section being the same, my difference is going to be these loads here. And I see that I've got two sections that are experiencing compression, so they are going to decrease in length. And then I have this middle section that's positive or in tension, so it's going to have an increase in length. So I need to be careful with my signs as I put together my final equation. I'm going to write this out as one big long equation. So we have the deflection from A to D is equal to my area and my modulus of elasticity are constant. So I'm going to move them outside of the equation. And then I have the different lengths and the different forces. So from A to B, I have negative 8 kilonewtons acting over 200 millimeters. From B to C, I have positive 4 kilonewtons acting over 150 millimeters. And then from C to D, I have negative 6 kilonewtons acting over 100 millimeters. My deflection A to D is going to equal to negative 1600 kilonewton millimeters all over my area and modulus elasticity. So my area is going to be pi over 4 times 15 millimeters quantity squared. It's the cross-sectional area that's perpendicular to that axial force. And my modulus of elasticity is 200 gigapascals. You will find that a gigapascal is equal to a kilonewton per millimeter squared. So with all of my units being in kilonewtons and millimeters, they're all going to cancel out and leave me with millimeters for my deflection from A to D. I find that deflection to be negative 45.3 times 10 to the negative 3 millimeters of axial deflection for the entire system.